At Al Jazeera's investigative unit, we've conducted a forensic, meticulous examination of the events of October the 7th. We uncovered very real crimes committed by Hamas and others. But I think what was perhaps most significant were the crimes we discovered that did not happen. And it's hugely concerning that these revelations have been virtually entirely ignored by the Western press. What's extraordinary is the Israelis were aware of the plans. Hamas were actually training quite openly for this operation, and they were actually placing the training videos online so anyone could view them. On the very night of October the 7th, before dawn, spotters along the fence are reporting back to headquarters, and the head of Shin Bet and the head of military intelligence take this seriously enough that in the middle of the night, they're up and talking to each other, and they conclude it's just another training exercise. And what is extraordinary is that they don't even raise the alert level to number one. You know, the most basic alert level would have made a huge difference. And they don't do that, which means that when Hamas bursts through the fence at 6.30 in the morning, they catch many of the defenders in their beds. I mean, you can see many of the soldiers are killed in their beds. Hamas had anticipated most of their fighters would be killed trying to get through the fence. In fact, only a small number were killed trying to get through the fence. They were as much taken by surprise as anyone by the performance of Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military. Crucially also, they were taken by surprise by this very large music festival that was taking place, which they don't seem to have been aware of. Having over on the military bases, the game plan was to grab hostages and take them back. And they do this on a large scale, but they also clearly kill very large numbers of, of unarmed civilians as well. The Israelis were then extraordinarily slow to respond. Now, they scramble Apache helicopters, but there's no ground control. It's pretty clear that in the chaos, some hostages at least were hit by Apache helicopter fire. We've identified 27 people who were clearly taken hostage, taken captive, and were taken away from their homes, but never made it to the fence, died somewhere between their homes and the fence. There's a fair chance that a number of them were killed by Apache helicopters. Within the kibbutzes, we've identified 18 people who were pretty much certainly killed by the police and the army as they arrived. 12 of them, a specific incident in kibbutz Beri, where you have a large number of gunmen, around 40 gunmen, holed up in a house with 13 hostages. A tank is brought in and, and opens fire on the house. There are two survivors from this incident, which is why we know about it. There may be other incidents we don't know about because everyone was killed, but there are two survivors from this who spoke to Israeli media. There's a common sense thing. You just have to look at the scale of the destruction, and it's clear that 1,200 men armed with rocket-propelled grenades and machine guns did not do all of this. The Hannibal Directive which was something that was developed in the 1980s by the Israelis, and it was basically to avoid situations where their enemies would capture one or two or three Israeli soldiers and then effectively hold them to ransom. There was one occasion where the Israelis released over a thousand Palestinian prisoners in return for a single Israeli soldier. So an order was issued whereby they said, it's better that we kill everyone than allow people to be captured. Now this was supposedly rescinded several years ago. But at midday on October the 7th, the army revived the Hannibal Directive, put it into effect. 70 vehicles were hit. At least in some of the cases, everyone in the vehicle was killed. The Israeli military does not deny the report. The peculiarity of the days after October 7 is that the Israeli media and subsequently the international media choose to focus not on the very real and extensive crimes that Hamas and others did commit, but on crimes they did not commit. And this had two focuses. In the days immediately after, it's to do with babies. So the most dramatic one is we see an allegation that there were 40 babies killed, many of them beheaded. This is very simple to deal with because we have a comprehensive list of the dead. We know that two babies are killed on October the 7th. One is a 10-month-old child who is hit by a bullet fired through a safe room door. The other is a child who dies after an emergency caesarean, a Bedouin child, in fact. Now, any story about babies that does not relate to those two, and there are a lot of stories about babies, is not true. We know it's not true. This has enormous implications for the other wave of atrocity stories that began very quickly, which is to do with sexual violence, and particularly the Israeli assertion that it was widespread and systematic. To be clear in the film, we are not saying that there were no rapes on October the 7th. We simply don't know. What we are saying is that there simply is not the evidence. 
There's not the forensic evidence, there's not the visual evidence, there's not the photographic evidence, and there is not the witness evidence to support the allegation of widespread and systematic rape. The Israelis have this strange system where they farm out the collection of bodies after disasters and terrorist attacks and so on to an organization called Zaka, who are ultra-Orthodox religious volunteers. They collect the bodies, prepare them for religious burial and so on. A character that many people will have seen in the days afterwards is Yossi Landau, who was the southern commander of Zaka, who was on television a great deal. He said the two piles of 10 children each were tied to the back burned to death. You then see a phone call which Netanyahu makes to President Biden where he repeats this story. In fact, he embellishes it. They took dozens of children, bound them up, burned them, and executed them. Terribly important this because it was entirely untrue. We know the house he's talking about. He's talking about the house in Kibbutz Beri, which was the house that was stormed by Israeli police and military, and where it is almost certain that all of the hostages were killed by the Israeli police and military. There were two children there, two twins, but no other children, so we know the story is untrue. Mr. Landau told a number of other stories. There's one particularly notorious one about the fetus being cut out of a pregnant woman. The baby that was connected to the cord was stabbed, and she was shot in the back. We simply know this is untrue. The list of the dead show there's no such victim. Mr. Landau said, you know, I have a picture of this atrocity. If you want to see the picture, I have the picture of it. This is the baby. I'm sorry to be graphic here, but I, I can't see a baby here. You can't see the baby because, but this is the picture of the, of the mother. It was a piece of charred flesh. It wasn't a baby. It certainly wasn't a baby. So it was interesting. And psychologically, I'm not quite sure why he offered to show me a photo that he didn't have. I'd point out as well that Zaka was an organization that was in trouble. There had been a major scandal. Its founder had been accused of child sexual abuse. There was a financial scandal. It had been found to be cooking the books. It's raised an awful lot of money since October the 7th. These stories were clearly useful, and they were useful to the Israeli government. In the film, we see Benjamin Netanyahu visiting Zaka volunteers and thanking them for talking to the world's media and stressing that this is another front in the war. <laughs> Why does this matter? Why does it matter whether this type of atrocity was committed, but not that type? People were killed in this way, not that way. It matters because the murder of babies and widespread rape has a particular resonance. It's particularly triggering. The Israeli government and its supporters, when they justify the brutality of the subsequent bombardment and invasion of the Gaza Strip, again and again and again, what they always reference is babies and rape. Young girls who were raped and then murdered. Women brutally raped and murdered. Little kids who are beheaded. Pictures of terrorists beheading children. These bastards put these babies in an oven and put on their oven. We found the kid a few hours later. This is something you see in previous conflicts as well. If you want to dehumanize an enemy, if you want to desensitize people to the suffering that is inflicted on that enemy, then you portray them as barbarians, basically as savages, as people who are not deserving of humane treatment. And that's why it's relevant. That's why it's important to pick apart. A lot of the world's leading media outlets have done in-depth investigations where they have concluded there was widespread, systematic, instrumentalized, weaponized rape. The New York Times makes a particular feature of the story of a young woman. She was killed early in the morning, nine miles north of the music festival site as she and her husband were fleeing. The New York Times, in its big December investigation into sexual violence, leads with this, and about a third of the article consists of her story. And it's immediately undermined because the woman's sister then posts on Instagram immediately afterwards, this isn't true, we know she wasn't raped. She was texting us until minutes before her death. It's also the case that her husband had a lengthy phone conversation immediately after her death with his brother, and again, made no mention of rape. So it's very important that because it's the central, most compelling piece of information in one of the biggest investigations done by one of the world's most prestigious media outlets, the New York Times, and it turns out not to be true. It's done by three journalists. One of them turns out to be somebody who worked in some capacity for Israeli intelligence previously, who has virtually no journalistic experience, and then who had liked uh, genocidal media posts. It's very interesting with Anna Schwartz. She gives an interview in Hebrew to an Israeli 
channel, she actually lays out how difficult they were finding it to find evidence that they, they were talking to all the hospitals and all the psychiatric clinics and so on, and that there was simply no evidence at all. There were no witnesses had come forward, no, no victims had come forward at all. I think she's telling this as if to, to show what digging they had to do, but it's actually very revealing. In the end, it's quite clear they fall back on the same sources as everyone else, Israeli government officials, IDF officers, and first responders, all sources which were discredited by the baby stories. So no babies were beheaded, no babies were, were thrown into ovens, and there is no real evidence for widespread and systematic rape. Now, it's very clear why the Israelis might want these stories to, to circulate. What's less clear is why very reputable Western news and media outlets should swallow them so uncritically, particularly given the track record of the Israeli government and the IDF which has been shown again and again and again in the past to have been less than truthful in the accounts it gives. Because our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. While this mission is urgent, we will continue to fulfill it with care and with a commitment to the sanctity of life, both Israeli and Palestinian. The response to our film, October the 7th, has been interesting. The response is not to criticize and to pick apart and say we've got it wrong, uh, they don't do that at all. What they do is they simply ignore you, which on one level I take as a compliment because I think there are all sorts of people out there who would very much like to pick apart what we're doing and to destroy it and discredit it. And I think they take one look at it and decide they can't really do it. So what they do do, which in a way is even more damaging, is just to entirely ignore us. This is significant because so often what we are doing is critiquing the way the mainstream media has covered the story, which may well be, of course, precisely why the media doesn't want to look at what we've done. So in a way, the treatment of this in many ways echoes the treatment of our earlier series, The Labour Files, which offered a critique of the dominant media narrative about Corbyn and the Corbyn years on the anti-Semitism crisis. The allegation of anti-Semitism clearly is a very powerful weapon that can be wielded in defense of the Israeli state. I think sometimes, particularly by the Israeli state, it is wielded very cynically and very deliberately. When the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. It's not the case in Western media and Western societies that you cannot criticize Israel. You can, now you have to be a bit careful about how you do it, but certainly at the moment during the assault on Gaza, you certainly can. What you cannot do is to question the fundamental philosophy of Zionism. What you are not allowed to do is to say what all Palestinians would say. Israel is a state whose defining feature is and has always been that it is structured to ensure the domination of one ethnicity over another, that it is in effect an apartheid state, which is what all of the world's human rights organizations now describe it as. The enormous peculiarity and dysfunction of Western media with Israel is not only does it not say that, you're actually not allowed to say that. And this renders criticism of Israel perilous terrain. People are very on edge. They're very aware that they're straying into dangerous territory. They're very aware they have to choose their words terribly carefully, otherwise they will be misconstrued. You can see this happening at its worst within the Labour Party, where particularly Jewish people are far, far more likely to be suspended and expelled for anti-Semitism from the Labour Party than non-Jewish people. But there is something more fundamental that goes on, which regards the Palestinian people as a whole. Once you have tainted them with the stain of anti-Semitism, you have opened the door to, you have facilitated the dehumanization of Palestinians, which is the psychological prerequisite of Israeli brutality towards the Palestinians and of Western complicity in that brutality. Palestinians will often make the point that they did not choose who their occupier was, who their colonizer was. So in fighting back, yes, they are in inevitably fighting back against Zionists and Jews. It doesn't mean they're anti-Semitic. One has to ask oneself the question, are we really saying that if they had been colonized by Greeks or Italians, they wouldn't be resisting their occupation. Of course they would. 36 Israeli children were killed on October the 7th, and this understandably got widespread international media coverage. At this stage, I think over 14,000 Palestinian children have been killed. And you would expect the outrage and the coverage to be proportionately greater, and it's not. 
in future people will look back at what is being done, which is essentially the flattening of a whole series of towns and the mass murder of thousands and thousands of unarmed civilians, almost half of whom are children. And they will be absolutely bewildered by how the West allowed this to happen under its very noses with weapons that were being supplied by the West. There is a rupture in the relationship of large numbers of people with the political media class. There is a fundamental alienation that is going on right now as a result of what is happening in the Gaza Strip. I think that's very dangerous for the future. The events of October the 7th are a case study in how traditional media can let us down and how we desperately need alternative voices that will genuinely probe these things and not simply accept the narratives that are fed to them. For this reason, I think it's enormously important to have outlets like Double Down News, and I would urge you to support Double Down News in any way you can.